for inviting me. My apologies to those who have I have missed him on Monday and earlier on Tuesday. I just couldn't come here any earlier. Um, and um, thanks for coming so early at 9 o'clock. So uh, let me start with the following thing, right? Some of those, those of you who have young children probably know that uh, this week is sort of a hard time to travel, right? Tomorrow is Halloween and kids sort of expect you to be at home tomorrow. So uh, the only condition under which my kids let me go and give a talk here was that I would actually give the talk dressed this way. <laughs> Uh, and I hope that somebody takes a picture that I can actually take, uh, send it off to my kids and show them that uh, I've actually done this. That's right now. Yeah. Yes, I'm recording that. Oh, dear God. Now, it's the first time I'm doing something like that in a cat on a hat costume, but, you know, let's see how it goes. Good. Um, this is the following thing. Um, I didn't quite know what to talk about until very recently, um, and the idea as a whole was that uh, at least some of the work that we be uh, delivered to you by Andrew Levchenko, right? Uh, um, so as a result of that, what I decided to do last night when I was sort of sitting down and figuring out what I will talk about is uh, to remove some of the parts of the talk that I actually wanted to deliver and introduce in the very beginning some of the sort of papri of things that we do and sort of introduce you to things that you would have heard about if Andre was here or maybe if some other collaborators that we work with were here, right? So uh, the talk is sort of now probably predictive information and other things that we do. Right? So before I go there, let's just start with who I am, what, what <coughs> our lab does. Um, so what we're interested in is how, in how biology processes information. How biology learn, how systems learn from incoming signals. Uh, so in many respects, uh, this, is, this is a meeting that I sort of feel I should be in, and I'm very glad that I was invited. Uh, this is what we do, biological information theory. Uh, and we do not um, get focused on specific uh, micro or biological systems. We're interested in more general questions that span different areas from individual cells into populations of cells. What we're interested in is in trying to understand what are the limits of information processing capabilities sort of by things like a finite number of molecules inside the cells, the structure of the and all that. Like that. Uh, what are the mechanisms uh, used to environment right? special organisms actually use in order to be able to perform better? What are the necessary mathematical sort of tools and frameworks that we need to develop in order to understand a what biology does? From understand that. So uh, what I, as I said earlier, especially since uh, I don't know about three quarters of people in this room and I don't see some of the previous talks I've given, what I've decided I'll do is first maybe ten examples. There's going to be a long lunch break. You can ask me those questions. What you know. So the first one, I think this picture may not have been shown, but the talk, as it's a, it's a, the, the work that, that described was mentioned by Peter in his, uh, in his lecture, right? The paper that we published was Andrei Levchenko, and again, he would have talked about it if he was here, uh, where what we tried to do is we tried to estimate really the channel capacity of a certain signaling pathway, which is that to an RB signaling pathway, there is also Additionally, an ATF2 response, so it's actually a branch network with multiple inputs and multiple uh, And we're interested in, this in trying to figure out how many bits does the system actually, does this uh, signaling system, system transmit about the concentration of TNF in the outside world, right? Um, the, interest, the interesting question was, of course, that uh, if you look at the Wikipedia description of what uh, KPB does, it's supposed to make a choice out of 20 different phenotypic response to whatever the perturbations are. And if you want to make a choice out of 20 commitments, you better have log 2 of 20 bits in the, uh, in the system, right? And so when we analyze the system by measuring on a single cell uh, accuracy the concentrations, input concentrations, and the output, uh, molecular uh, output in, in the system, and doing full honest maximization uh, over the incoming probability distribution to actually have the channel capacity of the system to the maximum information that could be transmitted, we got numbers which were about ballpark one bit per event, which sort of made you made us 
question, you know, whether the general story about an FKPB is actually true or not. What was even more interesting is that uh, by looking at various different uh, informations uh, through multiple inputs, multiple outputs sort of in the system, uh, we were able to distinguish where much of the information gets gets dissipated, right? Where it's lost, where, where is the bottleneck in the signaling system. And specifically, we were able to figure out this was the, uh, this is the experimental, um, um, this is experimental uh, data with some multivariate signaling system, uh, and this is a certain model for the two agree reasonably well. And this model is a model where in the bottleneck is in the receptor binding, not in the sub receptor sort of uh, signaling events, which is where everybody assumed uh, problems are, but in actually binding to the receptor. The receptor seems to be very, very noisy, right? So not only we actually get numbers from the system, you know, by itself, one bit, what is it good, is it bad, what does it mean, why should one care? But by looking at various different information, sort of this way, that way, this way, we can figure out uh, where the problem is in the signaling and then try to figure out how to resolve it. It turns out that the cells have actually a collective signaling process where they talk to each other in average or multiple cells, right? So you had a question, please. Yeah, you said capacity. Uh, what are the units of that? I mean, how are you measuring What are the capacity? units of? Well, bits is bits. Right. If you're talking about actual channel capacity, right. at least in the Shannon sense. It should be bits per second, right? Well, yes, and there's an epoch. There's an epoch of signal sure. using the channel. All so, the time. so in this in this case, um, we made a substantial approximation because the signaling is rather slow in the system. It takes about half an hour to forty minutes. What we were interested in is in a number of bits transmitted per signaling event, right? Per single presentation of the stimulus, right? It's not actually a block, long block. There is a paper coming out, or maybe it already came out uh, in Science by Roy Goldman's group at San Diego where they were able to use basically the same technology, just generate about 10 times more data, and they were able to look at the uh, channel capacity in the system, where they looked at uh, a time series response to a, nonetheless one, per, one uh, presentation, one instant of the presentation of the signal, but then a time series response of about three or four points in a time series, right? This, of course, requires more data, and they were able to do this now. The paper is in the country that <coughs> just came out, right? And they get numbers about 1.2 or 1.3 bits per such a signaling event. So we didn't re really, as we expected, because signaling is so slow here, we didn't lose much by, by just looking at one-to-one. -one. So what's a stimulus? Stimulus here is a concentration of TNF, or too many versus factor beta. You dump a ton of, uh, we, a lot no, of we don't dump a ton. We dump a certain number which we control down to an accuracy of about 0.1 of a percent. Uh, and we know that we control it to this accuracy. We also know that our measurements of the response is down to an accuracy of a fraction of a percent. Uh, we know this because we measure the response in multiple different ways, which would not be correlated here unless they were measuring the same thing to the same to this accuracy. So this is one of the things that we do. And now with Andre, we are working. Uh, which again, would have been a talk, a piece of the talk that he would have presented. We are working on a somewhat more interesting system. This is a extract from mammary gland of the mouse. And uh, this is the piece of a tissue, the epithelial uh, tissue, which is going to form the mammary effects right, during growth. And so uh, they grow in response to what's called an EGF uh, configurations. And so what happens is uh, this system is actually in um, so connections, all of the physiology of that is intact. We're really taking it from an individual mouse. Um, and so what happens is you, if you apply gradients to an individual cell, look, here are small individual cells in the system, then this is sort of the circular histogram of where the um, cells go. And clearly there is no preference. The cells don't know whether there is an up gradient or whether there is a down gradient, right? Um, if you apply it to the whole organoid, then among many organoids, there's a pretty clear bias uh, towards the direction where the gradient is. If what you do is you apply to a system a certain chemical called endocellin, uh, which blocks gap junctions between the cells, um, uh, then there is, again, no bias, right? Uh, so it turns out this is a collective signaling effect, where a collective information processing effect, where a single cell or a bunch of cells that don't talk to each other cannot know which way to go, and the cells which do, which are talking to each other, know which way to go. By the way, the scale here, the gradients that we're talking about are about two nanomolars per millimeter. Right? This is an incredibly small number of molecules. We're talking about for a 10 micron size cell, 
we're talking about maybe a hundred molecules per, of EGF per cell volume on the low side of, the, of this, uh, and this is about this is about 600 microns plus, right? This is 100 micron bar. Um, and on the other side of it, we're talking about maybe you know twice as many, right, uh, cells per uh, molecules of EGF per signaling system. So what we can do, this is actually, how do the cells actually talk to each other? Uh, how do they figure out which way to go? It turns out that they measure concentration of EGF by two different mechanisms, or the same mechanism which is later splits into two different signaling molecules. One of them, which we call the X here, is not diffusive, and the other one, which we call the Y here, is diffusive. The Y diffuses through gap junctions between the cells and sort of calculates the average concentration of EGF over this entire organoid body. And as the X knows the concentration just at the H, right, because X doesn't diffuse. And so the difference between the two allows you to figure out whether you are at the leading edge or the receiving edge of the system. Uh, what this should remind you of uh, is a classical um, relay, right? It's a relay channel where what happens is the background concentration, um, sort of the average concentration gets sent to each one of these individual cells, which then later relays a signal to the edge cell. And then at the edge, the X, the local concentration, and the average concentration are being con compared, right? And of course, this also should remind you of uh, the telephone game, right? Where you're trying to send a message. You know, this guy sends a message to this one, that one sends a message to the next one. And we know that if this line gets to be kind of long, then the message doesn't get through very well, very easily. And so one can try to calculate what should be the effect of the uh, of this system size on the accuracy of the gradient sensing. And you get the results which, depending for different parameters, uh, are either this, this, this. And this is the experimental results. And so our statement is that the cells basically talk to each other with a diffusive um, coupling over about three cell uh, lengths. Right. So the cells talk to each other over about three cell lengths, which would be about 30 microns. And that's consistent with the with the experimental data that we that, that we have. And of course, we have a lot more data to show. I'm just showing you one plot. Right. So as far as I know, this is the first example of uh, somebody analyzing a relay channel in a, um, in, in, a, in, in, in a biological signaling context. Right. Yes, please. Little n0. Uh, n0 is the number of cells that you talk to, right? So it's a, roughly speaking, it's the diffusive, it's how far the molecules of this signaling, diff diffusive, mole diffusive sig messenger diffuse uh, until they get degraded. So they get diffused between about one and three cells on both sides before they disappear. If you want to ask me what, what is that molecule, it's calcium, right? It's not molecule, it's an ion, calcium ion. Um, that's uh, when we block uh, selectively the gap junctions for just calcium diffusion, uh, that, that effect also disappears. You're telling us between, from this data on the right that the green curve is a better fit than the blue curve? Uh, green, and, green and blue are reasonably the same, I, and I wouldn't argue which one of the two it is. I personally think its number is probably closer to three or four because there are downstream signal, downstream noise in the system, uh, and this is calculated in the, with the approximation that there is no downstream noise, as so small as possible downstream noise. Uh, the more noise you get, uh, effectively, uh, this, this, this acts up as uh, effectively meaning that you are averaging over fewer and fewer molecule uh, cells, right? So I personally think it's about three or four. I cannot rule out that it's as small as 1.8. So if n little, little n0 was 0, then you were back to the uh, If n was um, 0, then it would be no communication. So example. why is it that there is this, this much scoop? So like you increase Which little n0 and you get closer and closer to the no communication line? Uh, if I increase... But if I switch it back to 0, then I should be on that line again. Um, let's be careful. Uh, what's plotted here is the probability of going up a gradient. We normalize. We know what is the probability of the of the cells actually choosing the right gradient, right? right choosing the right direction. Um, so if there was no communicate, if if there was, uh, they say, sorry, I'm sorry, Susanna. It should be not no communication, but there should be no communication noise, as the word has disappeared. Okay. I'm sorry, right? 
So this is with communication okay. noise and without. Uh, so thank you. This is a very important thing. I should change this. So the no communication is the 0.5 line, right? Uh, so the no communication would be a 0.5 line, right? And so this is the line where this is broke per cell limit where there is no communication noise, where people, where the cells over very long distances can talk to each other. Thanks. That's I should change that. Um, okay. The other thing that we do in the lab uh, is looking at uh, large scale expression profiles or uh, genomic. Uh, sequencing now, my, my mRNA sequencing, uh, and trying to figure out uh, what are the interactions inside the cell. The idea being that if you have more of an RNA of a certain type, uh, and then there is more of target, uh, let's say the transcription factor, uh, then if there is more transcription factors, you'll probably get more of targets, provided that you also have sufficient molecules that, let's say, would phosphorylate this transcription factor and make it active, or would bind this transcription factor as a cofactor and make it active, and so on and so forth. There are all sorts of conditional associations which you can figure out and reconstruct sort of networks that look like this. And believe it or not, we have validated experimentally most of the edges in this network once we have constructed them, right? So the idea that what we use are basic properties of information, uh, let's say data processing inequality, if you have father-son, grandson relation, uh, then the similarity of information between father and grandson, or grand grandfather and grandson, is smaller than between father and son and the other father and son pair. And this way you can figure out who is directly talking to whom and where the correlation is an indirect one. And then looking at various higher order expansions of information, which are different from what uh, um, Chris said yesterday, that, that those ideas don't work here. Uh, but looking at various multivariate expansions, we can figure out things like, uh, let's say, transistor logic, where one activates the other if the third one is present, and things like that. Um, the other thing that we do is to we look at the uh, looking at the precise spike timing coding in the sensory system. This is similar to what Alex talked about. This is a fly. Um, you can record spikes from a certain neuron, H1 neuron, and then you can ask a question: How accurately? Uh, as a spike's position, right? To which accuracy positioning of a single spike is important in representing the outside world, right? And so what you do for this is you discretize a spike train in different resolution from about a couple of hundred microseconds to 20, 10, 20, 30 microseconds and see if there is more information between the signal and the response uh, as a function of this discretization. Uh, and what you see uh, is that down to about 200 microseconds accuracy, uh, the more precisely you know where the spikes are, the more information is actually being carried by the sensory neuron about the outside world, right? To my knowledge, uh, outside of some very specific auditory neurons where precision is very important, sort of for general uh, systems like this visual system over here, this is probably the most, um, the most precise coding that has been observed in any uh, sensory system outside of the, two of the neurons in your head that are used to figure out which way uh, the sound comes from, right? So the detection, uh, collision detector in neurons, right? Um, Here you, you say the information about the outside world, but this is a uh, vertical uh, movement of a, of a bar? Uh, no, what's happening here is that the fly is positioned on a rotor in New Jersey woods, uh, and it's rotated in exactly the same trajectory as other flies, which were recorded with cameras, uh, rotate. Right, so, so over here, the stimulus is the velocity of, of this motion of the fly and sees different st signals in front of it, and then you report from the neuron which supposedly estimates the motion of the fly, right? So the signal is the angular velocity curve. Yes? The information, is it the information that is achievable, or is it the bound line? Uh, this is the, basically, even though we don't calculate it this way, this is a, um, Total, uh, sort of this, this is a just estimated information between input and the response, where the input is a very, very large dimensional s sequence of uh, velocities, and the response are very long words. This is this is the words of 25 milliseconds, right? Um, uh, so uh, 25 milliseconds of spiking activity, right? And we just build p log p of this joint distribution, right, in order to get the initial information. 25 milliseconds is because the flies, it turns out, initiated turn in about 25, 28 milliseconds, and so it doesn't make sense to log at longer words because at that point, the action, like what Tali talked about, right, so self-action on the world actually affects what you're going to see. Yes? So is that graph showing bits per second or bits per this spike? Per, this bits per second. This sure. is bit per second. Right? Like and there is about 140, there is about 140 spikes per second in this system. Uh, 
uh, there's about 140 spikes per second in the system, so we're looking at about 1.1 bits per spike in the system. Okay. New paper that's just coming out, hopefully next week in both biology with Semsober. We did essentially the same analysis, but now on the other end of the brain, uh, where we looked at the neural activity of um, neurons in the RA, uh, which is a premotor cortex in the uh, Bengali sphinx. Uh, and so this is a cover of the journal that's going to come out. Uh, this is a neural activity. Again, you discretize it to zero one. What's interesting here is actually this is a song that the bird sings. A very famous composer, sorry to forgot his name, he actually recorded the Bengali speech song and transcribed it into a, into, a, into a music, right? So you get something that looks like this on the back end. And then you can ask how much information is there in an activity of a single neuron right? uh, in this RA uh, about the pitch, the volume, or other features, large scale features of the motor output of this, of this bird. And the usual story is, of course, that neurons participate in a collective coding, right? There's thousands and thousands of neurons driving the same muscle. The average activity of all of these neurons is what's going to matter. Well, in fact, what happens is if I partition, let's say, all possible uh, outputs into high volume or high, high pitch or low pitch, let's say, the green light line, um, so you have at most one bit of information that's we limit ourselves uh, this way. It's just you need to, to guess if I observe this particular sequence of spikes, uh, is the syllable that the bird is going to sing going to be above mid median pitch or below median pitch, right? Then it turns out that if you go down to the resolution of about one or two milliseconds in the positioning of this motor spike, uh, you still keep on increasing information. There is no information indeed at, at the rate, at, when you look at just the firing rate of neurons. A single neuron carries essentially zero information. Indeed, that's where the idea of a population code comes from. You need to have thousands and thousands of them to actually control the muscle, but if you look at a single neuron down at one or two millisecond resolution, it carries point, let's say, 13 of a bit out of one bit about whether the, this bird is going to be singing above or below median pitch, right? Um, so um, this is an interesting piece. Again, number is, of course, interesting by itself, or maybe not, but the, the idea is that uh, this way of actually learning something about how the encoding is, does, is done, right? Because in this RA system, uh, there has been, as in many other neural systems, uh, a big set of questions about how do you have so few, I mean, the number is very large, actually, right, millions, but still very few neurons that are able to control the motor output, which is as precise and as uh, variable as the bird song. I mean, if you've heard how this bird sing, you, you would see that, that no two are alike, and the same bird sings the same way again and again and again. So how can they do it? And there's just not enough neurons to control every muscle to a good enough accuracy if there is a population code. And what we show now is that there's actually a precise spiking code. So all of these things actually are dependent, sort of all this estimation that we have done depend on yet another big part of what my group does, uh, which is we develop algorithms for estimation of information from data, right? Uh, we all know that uh, entropy and information are very hard to estimate from data. All of the compression schemes, like LZIP, etc., etc., they produce you very biased results. They calculate, uh, they produce estimates of entropy or entropy rate of a data set which are limit, which are too low. The biases are very small. So what we have is this algorithm called the NSB algorithm, whatever, um, which uh, as of now I believe is the most accurate algorithm for estimation of uh, information of discrete data sets discrete data uh, from, from samples. And so what I show here is how this algorithm uh, behaves on measuring as a function of log of the number of samples, right? So this is uh, many samples, this is few. How this algorithm behaves on estimating the entropy rate of a spike train, right? Uh, and other algorithms would do some, something like that. They would converge to a good estimate at maybe 10 plus 4 samples for this particular data set. Two versions of our algorithm converge to the right result at about 10 to the 2 samples. Uh, and this is a general statement that our algorithms perform about square root better uh, than traditional algorithms based on maximum likelihood style estimators and corrections to those, right? So if maximum style like estimate requires a million samples, we will require only about a thousand, give or take. Um, and sometimes we will work, sometimes we won't, but if we don't work, we will tell you that we don't work. There's a good enough check to, to make sure that, that, that our result is, uh, you know, remains unbiased, right? And so this uh, estimate is what went into all of these papers uh, where whether it be the, the enough kappa B signaling or the bird song or the flies, uh, without those, none of this, is, we wouldn't be able to do the estimation, right? No, 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 no other algorithm can. So, yes?
or a tedious question. Why do you have error bars on your algorithm and not on the maximum one? Because our, ours is Bayesian. It produces posterior um, variances. Mm -hmm. And maximum likelihood doesn't produce posterior variances. This is just a maximum likelihood estimator. Of course, you can do um, you know, sort of expected variances, etc., etc. But it's not a Bayesian algorithm. That's how we decided to, to denote the fact that one is Bayesian as one is not. OK. Uh, so with that, let's move to the rest of the talk. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, overview the predictive information, which likely Tali has done quite well or, you know, a few days ago. So I'd have to, I can cut out a few slides from what I wanted to say and then uh, do a two additional applications of uh, predictive information that Tali didn't talk about, which is one in evolutionary biology and one in, in criticality in physical systems. And I thought I would also talk about thermodynamics, but clearly I've already spent 25 minutes talking. Um, uh, I won't, right? Uh, so uh, the point here is the first quarter of the talk, a third of the talk was about biology, but we're in mathematics institute, so no more animals from now on. I'm going to just be giving you formulas, right? Um, it's, it's, it's nice for a change because normally when I give talks in biology departments, I cannot give formulas, and I, I want to use this opportunity to do it today. So uh, first of all, uh, this is the people I need to thank. Uh, Bill was my advisor, and Tali was uh, not an advisor, but a very important commenter at the time when I was finishing my PhD at Princeton. And this is when my predictive information were, was introduced in our joint paper. So thank you very much, Tali. Um, and then these are various students and postdocs who worked with me over the last few years, and this is what I will largely talk about towards the, the end. These are various funding sources. The most important of them for me is the McDonald Foundation source. Um, so, Predictive information, why, right? So I'm not going to repeat what Tali has said, just uh, uh, a few additional points. Um, so what, to me, why it's important to look at this predictive information quantities rather than various rates, uh, it, specifically in biological applications rather than in electrical engineering applications, that all of the coding theorems in engineering applications are for long blocks, right? These are block codings. And it's OK if you are talking at a rate of one, you know, with your with speech at, at sound at about one kilohertz, right? And you are transmitting things at the speed of light with a 10 to the 14 frequency. You can afford to have a long block. It's not a big deal. You cannot do it in biology, right? When we have a signal, which is a molecular signal changing on a scale of a minute or two, and it takes about five, six minutes or something like that, and it's not random numbers, is what we're talking about, for example, in, in, in an F kappa B system, right? Five, six minutes to just get it down through the first receptor, and maybe another 20 minutes to respond, while external signal is changing at a scale of one, two minutes, and worst case, and maybe every half hour in the best case, you don't have a luxury of waiting for long. Uh, blocks before you start co encoding them, right? And so what one needs to start figuring out is what should replace all of these uh, quantities that we have uh, been working on in the electrical communication, right? So another way of saying this is in biological system, you always act in the future, right? Uh, because the communication and the signals and the response are all on roughly speaking the same scales, uh, you are never acting in the world as it is now you are getting information from the world in the past, you are making those decisions, and by the time you are ready to make decisions, it's already the future, right? So the only the part which is relevant to, to making predictions about the future can be used. Everything else is completely useless, right? Uh, there is no time scale separation, to put it another way. Uh, so how do we characterize predictive information? You know, again, I'm, uh, Tali has gone through all of this, but I want to repeat a few things because they're going to become important. Uh, so if you have, a just for simplicity, a single time series, which goes from past, uh, which could be either length t, or if we're talking about discrete sampling n samples, zero is now. Uh, in the future, it goes to the t prime samples or n prime samples, right, depending on whether it's continuous or discrete. Uh, we can calculate the predictive information as the information between all of the past and all of the future, which is the entropy of past plus entropy of future minus the joint entropy. Uh, and if we remember that the information is, of course, the extensive quantity, so I can write down any information as, as zero, the extensive part times the length, right, uh, plus a correction, which is sub-extensive, and you plug it in into this formula, what you immediately realize is that the extensive parts cancel, right, which means that any kind of predictability that you can make is only sub-extensive. In other words, predictability is deviation from extensivity, right? Uh, if there is no extensivity in entropy, there is no predictability. Um, and more specifically, the quantity that we 
cares most about is a specific version of that. When I take t prime to infinity, I'm making predictions about the entire future. Uh, and this is what we will call I predictive of t. And this gets to be exactly equal to the subextensive um, uh, term S1 of t. So subextensive entropy is equal exactly to the predictive information. And I use the two interchangeably. Nicely, uh, I, I couldn't resist to put the slide in. This is one of the slides from my thesis defense from uh, from 14 years ago without changes, so it just, just warms my heart a bit. Um, so, um, predictive information yeah. has, yes? One thing I wanted to ask is, um, so you know it's like a picture of infinity, and yes. you take a finite past and predict infinite future, why not the other way around? Next slide. Okay, uh, so let's look at the quantities of predictive information. And again, we're talking for now about stationary signals, right? So information, it's information, so it is greater than zero. Uh, it's subextensive. Uh, it is, it has diminishing returns, meaning that since entropy is extensive, it's proportional to T, the total amount of information which is predictive compared to the total amount of entropy that you've seen goes to zero, right? And the prediction post diction are symmetric, whether you calculate it from t to t prime infinity or the other way around, you know, whether you're predicting or post dicting, at least for stationary processes with no causality in them, uh, the two things are the same. What about processes with causality? Um, the 2013 paper that we published with Martin um, on non equilibrium phase transitions, which actually does have causality there, uh, we tried to answer this question. I don't think that we have fully answered that question, but the, uh, there, there is an asymmetry, right? If the processes which are, which are non-stationary uh, and, and, and the distribution change with time, there is an asymmetry between predicting the future and predicting the past, or post-dicting the past. But if you have really asymmetric processes, yeah. like you know, one-day functions, yeah. function, yeah. function yeah. So, but um, we did this in, in one, uh, one, one phase transition, not the real phase transition problem, but uh, I'm sure that there are others, right? That's, um, um, so let's see how the predictive information can behave, right? Because we know that it's subextensive, there is not that many choices. Um, the first could be that when t goes to infinity, this predictive information goes to a constant. And so what kind of processes are those? These are processes with no long range structure. Uh, there is not much to predict to learn, right? For how long you observe, you don't learn much. You learn just a constant. You know, you, you can observe for the entire age of the universe and you still haven't learned much. So this type of processes are sort of simply predictable processes, periodic processes, constant processes, or Markov processes, right? When you are beyond the correlation length, if your T is larger than the correlation length of Markov process, you've picked up everything there is to, 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 to talk about, right? Uh, completely random processes, the ideal gas trajectories, things like that. Uh, there is another case, which is what we're going to be focusing on for much of the rest of the talk. Um, this is a case when the limit of predictive information is proportional to the logarithm of time, and I'm going to write it as k over 2 times log time, which is going to become clear why I'm writing this way in a, in, 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 in a second. Uh, and so this is a situation when you are um, in the, let's say, learning theoretic language. If you are trying to learn, you know, the, the, the data series, the sequence that you are observing, allows you to learn something about the underlying dynamics, right? The process that has generated that series. And what you are learning is a finite number of characteristics of parameters of this underlying dynamics. So here is a situation, right? If, for example, um, there is the distribution of access, the signals that I observe, um, is given by, it's just they're conditionally independent given a certain um, set of parameters. Let's say they're all Gaussians, and this alpha is the mean of this Gaussian, right? Uh, but I don't know what alpha is. And so I have to average over all possible alphas to get the overall distribution of axis, right? So what happens now if I observe a certain time series, I can learn from that time series something about the underlying parameter which actually generated that series, right? What is the mean? I can calculate the mean and the variances and so on and so forth. And for every parameter that you can learn from this series, you are going to get one half log t subject to various constraints that the sort of phase space volumes don't you know, scale appropriately, there are no zeros in the measures and, and things like that, right? But roughly speaking, if I'm learning, a if I can learn a parameter from the data, I get half log t per parameter, right? Um, and what we have discussed in that original 2001 paper is that this is probably somewhat similar to critical phenomena in physics, right? At a critical point, 
to have long-range diverging correlations. And so the longer you observe, the longer the sequences you start looking at, the more information you pick up, right? You, even, you can look far, far, far away, but because correlations don't fall up to zero very quickly, you still learn something, right? So that's what we discussed, that's what we thought might happen, but we haven't actually shown it, and I will in a few minutes. Okay, um, the final case, which I will largely not focus on for the rest of the talk, is when the information, predictive information, goes as a power law with the exponent less than one, it has to be less than one because it's sub-extensive. And so there, what it means is that we're learning uh, from the data, we can learn a non-parametric model of this data. Right, so think of it where, again, we have uh, independent uh, distributions of axes, but another distribution is not parameterized by a single variable, by a single mean or variance, but there is a functional measure on all possible distributions, right? Uh, so P itself is an unknown function, maybe smooth, maybe it has some kind of properties of it. And by observing the axis, I'm trying to infer the entire P, not the means, the variance or the cumulants, but the entire P, right? In that case, you will, depending on what assumptions you make about the smoothness of P, so that's what is in this measure, you will get different exponents over here. Yes, please. So are you sort of assuming that these XIs are independent of one another, or you know how to take the measurement so that it's true? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not, uh, let me try to be a bit more careful. What I'm trying to say is, uh, we, we know a lot of examples in, 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 from, in data where the things happen. When, for example, for English language, it was estimated back by, 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 by Shannon, this uh, beta is one half, right? Well, it was not Shannon, but Shannon's data, which was later analyzed by, I forget, uh, German, I forget the name, I'm sorry, L. Uh, so Shannon, Shannon incorrectly analyzed his own data. The data was late, later reanalyzed. Uh, and they said that for English letters, uh, English language, beta is equal to one half, right? Um, so there, there's clearly no independence, right? But so what I want to understand is uh, what is the simplest process that would get me uh, something that scales as t to the one half, right? And the simplest process that scales, that gives me the scaling is independent data, which are taken from a functional measure which I'm, which, which I'm measuring, which I'm averaging over, right? Another example is when you try to learn a parametric process where the number of parameters changes with the an amount of observation. So think of it as language again, where if I look at very short uh, sequences of letters, I start f learning that that you know H follows after after T, right? And so you know the probability of H following after T uh, forming TH, right, is something that is is a parameter in the system which I can learn from the data. If I learn, uh, if I look at longer and longer sequences, eventually I will learn that every five or six or seven letters there is a space. And that's another parameter to learn. If I learn, at even look at even longer sequences, I see that verbs follow nouns, and that's something else to learn. And so the longer the observations are, not only I have a better estimate of how frequently H follows T, but I have more rules to learn, right? And so that example, I sort of worked it out in the 2005 paper. This is that example also <coughs> uh, um, a similar, uh, should give you a similar scaling. I wouldn't be able to say it's exactly one half or something, but that, that, that would depend on the details of how many rules you can learn from how many samples, right? Um, but again, this is the simplest example, right? So uh, why is this quantity use, useful, right? Um, these quantities, in some sense, obviously related to the stochastic complexity of learning theoretic problems, right? I just sort of illustrated this. The more examples you have, the more parameters you have, the harder it is to learn, the higher this quantity. There's more information to learn from the data. But it uh, turns out it's also one of the, uh, it's the only quantity that we could find which are based a certain set of axioms which could quantify the complexity of a time series. Like additivity, you know, two, ser two, two sequences together, the complexity should be the sum of two if they're independent. Positivity, continuity, the same axiom that Shannon did. And then another one, which is invariance to temporary local transformation. So the idea being that if somebody, if I took my, uh, let's say a sequence of velocities that my car had, you know, driving from my home to Atlanta airport, and that same velocity filtered through my speedometer, right, which sort of introduced a certain time delay, but I get the same complexity, right? So this tiny, small, you know, short uh, range filter shouldn't change the complexity. And if you believe this, which you can or cannot, it's up to you, then this is the only quantity which, uh, which, uh, which obeys this, uh, this, this criteria, right? Um, local means. Uh, local means that the um, exactly the same as we define locality in the uh, physics language, in that 
the uh, probability distribution of this uh, sequence uh, when you write it down uh, in terms of uh, e to the sum operator. Uh, uh, this operator uh, only has derivatives of a finite order, doesn't have integrals of integral. Right? Derivatives of uh, so, so for example, just, just again. Uh, the operator only has derivatives of, of, of small orders, like one or two, but doesn't have uh, integrals only, right? So, so the, the Hamiltonian could be like a kinetic term in, 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 a, in a field theory, but cannot be an integral differential sort of uh, Hamiltonian, right? Um, so why is this quantity useful, right? Well, we spent some time earlier to show that predictive information allows you to define universal learning curves uh, for data characterizes complexity, it's useful for robotics, which I'm sure uh, Daniel is gonna talk a bit about, I hope, right? Um, and then uh, Tali Tishby, um, and there is also an additional paper about a year ago from Stephanie Palmer and Bill Bialik showed that there is, that the neural systems are designed to extract predictive information from data and compress out, sort of lose all of the non-predictive information uh, from, uh, from, from, from what, what they see. In, in different systems, in mice, and in that case, they were dealing with um, uh, retina, salamander retina for Palmer's work, right? So what I want to do in the remaining, whatever it is, I started a bit late, 15 minutes, is to give one or two um, examples, if I have the time, of where else this quantity is useful. So what I'm going to talk about is adaptation. Um, and so adaptation is a key notion in evolutionary biology, right? It's establishment and maintenance of traits impro improving fitness by means of natural selection. Turns out that adaptation is also a key concept in physiology, right? And uh, my interest in this, in you know, as these two things related, my interest actually was picked uh, in this when, in one day, I went to two talks, one in the population biology program, one in the neuroscience program, one after another, one hour from each other, which both had adaptation in their titles. And the first intriguing thing was that I was the only person who went to, to go to both of these talks, so clearly people do not think that these two things are the same. And the way that they talked about them, uh, it was also clear that people don't think that these two things are related to each other, right? And so I, I decided to figure out as they. So we're going to do a specific example, which is actually very uh, popular nowadays in the microbiology community. This is a bacterial phenotypic switching and, uh, and uh, antibiotic resistance, non-genetic antibiotic resistance. So we're going to work out the specific examples, and then I'm going to just tell you the results for more general cases, right? Um, so here is a setup the world can have antibiotics with a probability alpha or one minus alpha, right? So it's a random basic process. There, is, there are epochs, right? In every epoch, there's probability of alpha of having an antibiotic or not having an antibiotic, right? Uh, and the bacterium can switch randomly once per generation, once per epoch. It can be in one of two states. It can be either persistent or normal. If it's persistent, it doesn't grow. Uh, if it's normal, it grows, right? But if it's persistent and there are antibiotics, it also doesn't grow, it doesn't do anything, antibiotics don't get in and so it survives. But if it tries to grow in the presence of antibiotics, uh, it's immediately killed. Right? So the payoff table for the bacterial state and for the world state looks something like this. Right? So those of you who um, um, uh, know the work of Kelly on the uh, gambling, connections of gambling and information theory, you will immediately re re recognize this. This is sort of the um, betting on the red and black and the roulette, right? Uh, and uh, you would like to bet in the right way. If you bet it in the wrong way, you lose all of your, um, all of your, all everything that you that you that you bet, right? Turns out that for the solution, what is the optimal strategy? The only thing that matters is that there is just one zero in the roulette. There would be a zero here, but there is this doesn't really change the solution. Just interestingly, right? And so, what is the optimal strategy? The optimal strategy is to be non-clonal. Uh, and each individual should switch randomly, irrespectively of any other individual, between two states, persistent and uh, growing state, with a probability which is matched. So the probability of persistence theta should be exi exactly equal to the probability of uh, uh, antibiotics. Right? This, uh, this is a matching law which has been observed independently in psychology, in Kelly's work, in bacterial Population, gene population studies, and so on and so forth. Again, very different communities. People don't talk to each other, right? Um, so it turns out that in this case, again, this is Kelly's result. Basically, the total uh, limit going to infinity of the logarithm of its population size, or in Kelly's example, this was how much money do you have after betting on the roulette, right? Uh, goes proportional to t with a certain growth rate, 
and this growth rate is exactly equal to the amount of information that your response strategy has about the state of the world. Right? So the more you know, the more money you, you make. Right? And so this is when people rediscovered this in population biology literature in about 2005. This made a lot of sort of <coughs> sounds, right? a lot of noise in the field, because suddenly we could say that bits matter, information matter. Right? It's not that we think that it's important, but it really is important. If you have more bits, you can, at least in these games, and hopefully maybe by continuity in others, you can actually grow faster and win the evolutionary game. Okay? So what we are going to consider is a situation. Mm -hmm. um, so switching doesn't cost you anything in terms of metabolic energy? Um, mm, well, yes, it does. But in these simple approximations, you really don't pay much attention uh, to that. Um, I think the more important part is that uh, in addition to randomly switching, you can also introduce sensory component. Um, and that makes this is probably more interest, more, more important of a connection of a next step uh, sort of development of the model and people like Labber actually have done this. Um, the reason why it's not really such a big of a deal in some sense is because it happens so rarely, right? Uh, and switching really means removal of about maybe 10 transcription factors from the system. Um, in the ballpark where the system, where the cell produces every minute about 50,000 proteins, removal of 10, not a big deal, right? Yes. Um, because then it's harder to calculate. Um, so this is a, again, uh, this is the simplest model. Uh, as far as I know, people are still trying to work it out in a, without the generational um, sort of clock. Um, all experiments that are done without generational clocks don't show matching. Animals don't evolve to exact matching. They evolve to something that is sort of close, but not exactly matching. Um, and what they're doing now experimentally is trying to design systems where you synchronize all of the times and so on and so forth so it can actually absorb this evolution in at least artificial or evolutionary systems. So people like uh, Ido Kassel do these things now. Okay. Uh, in the connection to Kelly information, in your simple example, the antibiotic is not sensing the world. The system is not so sensing the world. <coughs> uh, so the information that is, is there is between the rate of what the system does Right, of, of the theta and the value of alpha. Right? So uh, the, if you look at the state of the world and you look at, the, um, at, the, at what the bacterium has chosen and you calculate the information between the two, it's not going to be zero because if your alpha is much to theta, then it's indeed going to be the, key, you know, the case over all possible realizations of theta, right? If you average over all possible realizations of alpha, right? Then in this specific example, in this specific realization of theta and alpha, it will indeed be the case that uh, the environment is more often antibiotic and you yourself are more often resistant, right? And so there is going to be an interaction between the two and the information because you are averaging over all possible environments that could have happened. They're conditionally independent, but they average over all environments which, which creates the positive non-independence. That makes sense? Not entirely. I mean, uh, are you imagining a situation where I'm a biologist and I don't know what the, the frequency of antibiotic conditions so let me, is, let and me, I observe the bacteria and I get information let about me, the world Let me tell you what I'm imagining. I'm imagining this, right? And I want to sort of move to, because I have only five, ten minutes, and I'm clearly not even going to my second example, but I want to finish at least this one, right? Um, so um, the, the, this is what I'm mentioning. I have a bunch of populations of bacteria. They, they live in different worlds. Some of them live in your guts. Some of them live in soil. Some of them live in a dish in, in somebody's lab. Uh, and the frequency of antibiotics is different in all of these different uh, scenarios, right? And the bacteria don't know what is the frequency of antibiotics. They have to figure it out, right? Um, and so the, after so many generations, we can, fig we can pick up how many bacteria I have on this dish or in your guts or in the, in the soil and take the average log of these population sizes over all different alphas, right? Different probabilities of antibiotics. And what I would like to understand is how this quantity behaves, right? Uh, when the bacteria do not know that they're starting from a certain set of alphas but, and they don't know which, what is a true one in the world, right? There's two possibilities of how they can learn. So the, fir the first one is the Darwinian natural selection. 
uh, where you have different bacteria with different colors, meaning that we have different uh, alph alphas for different switching, uh, sorry, status, different switching rates to, 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 to antibiotic, right? And then if it happened that your switching rate is the right one, you will grow faster. If it happens that you, the right one in this case is red, uh, if it happens that you, your rate is wrong one, then you will grow slower. And eventually the population is going to be overtaken by the red ones simply because the other ones didn't procreate as fast as the others, right? So overall the population learns about the environment, but it learns on the population level, not on individual level. All the bacteria remain unchanged, right? They have this one rate with which they switch. And, and they're just selected, right? They're selection, it's a selection on standing variation problem, right? This is Darwinian evolution. You can think of a situation which is a physiological adaptation or equivalent to Lamarckian adaptation. The difference between the two is only in time scales, right? Where what happens is you have a population of bacteria which look outside in the world and they see, aha, over the last so many times, uh, I've, seen, I've seen antibiotics 10 times out of 20. Um, and so I should set my switch rate to 50%. And then I observe for a longer time, and I see antibiotics, you know, 53 times out of 100. So I switch my, I set my switch rate to 53 out of 100, right? 53 percent, and so on and so forth. And eventually, uh, because you observe for a very, very long time, right? Uh, eventually, what's going to happen is that the estimate, the frequencies, the, es the empirical frequencies, are going to con converge to true probabilities, right? Uh, in in the system, and all of the bacteria are also going to become red or the similar color, right? Um, so in this case, this is not a selection of standing variation. This is an individual adaptation, right? This is a population adaptation. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to calculate within this model uh, what is the total population size that we're going to, 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 to achieve in the Darwinian case and in the Lamarckian uh, case, right? So the interesting thing is that if I average over everything I can average over, sort of the probabilities of, uh, of, of this uh, alphas, the actual specific realization of sequences of the world within alpha, the uh, actual specific choices that every individual bacterium makes, and so on and so forth, I get that the log of the population size is t times lambda max, which is the same Kelly's uh, lambda max, minus one half log t, plus some terms of order one, and this is correct for both uh, Lamarckian and Darwinian evolution, right? Both of them result in exactly the same values up to log t, other one terms are different for both of these cases, right? Um, so bacteria eventually in both scenarios grow at the maximum growth rate, and there is a cumulative penalty for starting with wrong rates, right? Just having a part of the population has wrong rates or making an incorrect inference because you don't have sufficient uh, information about the environment, and this two different penalties in two different situations amount to the same thing. So the assumption that we put into the situation is that populations are infinite and there's sufficient amount of variation to cover essentially all, every possible switch rate uh, with a non-zero probability. Uh, and the, for the physiology case, each cell has perfect memory up to infinity and can keep this memory and make an infer inference based on that. Of course, if you relax both of these uh, scenarios, you get um, Corrections, and it turns out actually the same correction. Having, very, having stochasticity in the first case and having finite memory in the second case result in exactly the same corrections to this one half log t, basically limiting some, this t to some effective t max over which you cannot keep the memory, right? Uh, memory sort of only goes to a certain t max. So, uh, why is this happening? Why is these two adaptations result in the same result? So, I an initially thought that Lamarckian is going to do better, right? Why? Because every individual does the right thing. While in the Darwinian case, somebody does the right thing and somebody does the wrong thing, right? So if everybody does the right thing, then presumably you should win, right? It turns out not so. So what happens is that the world, of course, even if theta is equal, uh, even if the world has a 50% probability of being in the antibiotic state, if you observe it for 100 times, it could be 47 out of 100. It could be 53 out of 100, 57 out of 100, right? You will, the f frequencies are not equal to the probabilities for a finite sum, right? And both adaptations are fast enough to adapt the entire population to the empirical frequencies, right? So the loss, the error, the, comes from the fact that you are overfitting. You are adapted to your empirical frequencies, which themselves converge to the um, to, the, to, the, to, to the true state of the world with the same rate in both cases. And so what happens is that uh, the, it's imperfect knowledge of the truth of the world that penalizes the growth. It's really the learning 
right, that penalizes the growth rather than the learning different learning scenarios, right? It's what the environment has revealed about itself that limits the speed of growth rather than the mechanism by, at least in this under this assumption, the mechanism that, that allows you to extract this information. And of course, what you notice, uh, so in a more general scenario, uh, there's going to be a case there, right? So if you have uh, your adaptive strategy is not one parameter, switch, non-switch, but maybe it's switch, and then there is a certain time over which you are not allowed to switch, so now if you have two parameters, maybe you have five parameters, 20, it's always the same that as long as these parameters actually affect the growth, right, as long as they are um, a knob that can affect the growth, then this parameter is going to come up there uh, one half per parameter that you can, that you can ad 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 adjust, right? And the only assumption that goes there is that the fitness landscape here is learnable, meaning that there are few separate, well-separated peaks, which of course is a big assumption and is not true in many different scenarios. And if it is not true, then you have a glassy landscape where we know that learning is not nearly as fast as in simple pictures, and maybe you will start getting power loss there. We'll leave it to the next paper, right? Um, so, of course, we've seen these formulas before. This k over 2 log t is exactly the predictive information, and it's exactly the predictive information of the time when you are learning a specific finite number of parameters about the problem. In this case, I'm learning the switch, the probability of seeing antibiotics, right? And so, uh, the, uh, the, this one half log t penalty comes from the fact that you are that you are that, that you are learning one parameter, right? Um, it's not again mechanism related. It is the learning penalty for both of these populations. Um, you can actually think about it in the same way as you think about Bayesian information criteria and ask what is the optimal number of control knobs that uh, uh, an individual should have if it has a certain time horizon of about, let's say, t times, t units of time uh, before the environment changes. Let's say a bacterium lives in my guts for a couple of hours and then it goes outside, right? So in this one hour, it may have enough time to learn one parameter, but it may not have enough time to learn two or three or four or ten parameters, right? And so depending on this horizon of how fast you need to relearn your parameters, you may have a different optimal number of knobs, right? And indeed, uh, this term, the growth rate, eventually if you have many, many knobs that you can tune, you will have a very fast growing rate. But unfortunately, this uh, k over 2 log t um, goes with a negative, uh, so decrease uh, is a negative uh, pro proportional to log t. This is positive proportional to t. So for a fixed t, there is going to be a trade-off between this, the two of them, right? Uh, this one increases when you have more parameters. This one decreases when you have more parameters. So at the fixed t, you have um, a, a trade-off between the two things. And so you don't want to have the largest number of adjustable knobs. You will have overfitting, right? The optimal number of knobs, even in the same environment, may be determined by the time horizon in this environment. And maybe my sort of dream is that this at least partially contributes to why there is so much diversity even in the same environment, is because you don't live there for the same amount of time, and therefore you don't need the same complexity of machinery, the same number of parameters to learn, at least partially, right? Yes? So then you compute the k-max of the function? Sure. Um, so um, it turns out that I can compute it, but it's much harder to measure it. Um, so we have some estimates of the um, number of, let's say, transcription factors, which in the first approximation is what, how many knobs the system would have in different bacteria depending on the duration of time they spend in the same fixed environment. Overall, there is a reasonable linear correlation between the number of parameters and the, let's say, diversity of the environment, right? The, the, sorry, sorry, the linear negative correlation. So the, if for, for the same amount of time you, you spend in the environment, I'm sorry, for the same environment, the smaller time you spend in that environment, the fewer, par the fewer transcription factors bacteria have, but they will only have about 10 points on that plot, so I'm not showing it. Uh, we, we still need to, to, get, to get more statistics to show that this, this actually makes sense. So the number of parameters is not always the best measure of complexity. Um, so why is it, why is it correct? It's not the best measure of complexity. This is, as I said before, uh, as under the assumptions that all the measures never touch zero, etc., etc., et, cetera, et cetera, the, this is the best number of parameters. And we're working through it's, yeah, it's, it's the same story as the minimal description lines as BIC and, and so on and so forth. In principle, what stands here is the dimensionality of the, scale, you know, the scaling dimension of the um, 
of how many different models are within epsilon from a given model. Uh, and that not, not always equal to the number of parameters, but for simple models that we're considering, uh, it is. Right? That's, um, and so the last the conclusion here, and I'm not going to the second part, is that the Darwinian Lavakian physiolog physiological adaptations sort of follow nearly the same limits. Um, speed of optimal adaptation is limited by the ability to learn, not by the implementation of these two different learnings. There is an optimal number of adjustable knobs. And the last part I want to point out is that if you're sort of following the political discourse in the US, there is a sort of these two camps, right? So roughly speaking, liberal Democrats and the, uh, um, and the uh, Tea Party Republicans, right? Uh, one of them is, says, you know, let's, let's more or less have a collective decision making on the scale of the government and make things better. Uh, the other one is, you know, everybody for himself and, and whoever wins deserves it, right? And it turns out that, of course, the Tea Party Republicanism is in some sense a Darwinian selection, right? You know, if I win, great, if not, then not. The Lamarckian story is a story where the, at least a parallel to that would be when a central committee makes a decision of, you know, everybody has to be insured and so on and so on and so forth. And so it's a good thing for everybody, so we should be all doing that. Uh, and at least in these approximations, uh, the two result in the same growth of the population or getting back to Kelly in the same growth of the economy of the number of dollars that you are going to have. And so that's kind of cute, right? I'm, 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 I like this part. I'm going to skip the whole last, last part and just focus on this conclusion, right? That the predictive information, uh, which was sort of introduced originally when thinking about neural information processing, has in some sense much wider application, uniting many and maybe even all explicit and implicit inference phenomena, right? So in uh, natural selection, physiological adaptation, the part that I missed, which is equilibrium uh, and non-equilibrium criticality, which you can view physical processes of, of criticality as learning what are the underlying um, coupling constants in, in the system from observing, let's say, positions of spins, uh, and you can get the same log T or log N uh, scaling there with different prefactors in front, right? Um, and so the thing that I'm curious about, and I would hope that somebody in the room like Tali is thinking about these things very heavily, is uh, how do we get nice coding results for these quantities like predictive information, right? So that we don't just estimate it. I mean, I'm good at estimating things from data, but I'm not good at proving coding results. And hopefully somebody else here, maybe Tali, maybe somebody else, in a few years will tell us, uh, you know, what does it mean in terms of, in terms of coding. The last thing is um, we have been running for 10 years this conference, QBio conference on cellular information processing. I started in Santa Fe next year. It's going to be in uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. So those of you interested, you know, take a look and maybe you'll want to come. So Ilya, I understand how information about the future is more valuable in any situation than information about the past mm -hmm. and the predictive information that makes this distinction. But surely in the future there must be different sources of information that are more important or less important in different conditions. And I don't see how, is that already built into predictive information somehow where you, you have these multiple parameters? So suppose there's two antibiotics and one is really toxic and the other one's just sort of a nuisance. And I could, you know, preferentially process the information about one or so, the other. So Does I'm, that show up? Um, yes and no. So let me give a more bigger answer than you probably hope for, right? So all of the calculations are asymptotic, right? Uh, so if I get to, if I want to apply uh, asymptotic calculations, it means that my strategy is actually eventually very, very close to the point where it's nearly optimal. And in that case, uh, whether it's a strong antibiotics or a weak antibiotic, right? Uh, the choice, right, of what it is, that the, the importance of selecting the right, a right antibiotic or a wrong one, um, the, the underlying distribution of the, of the population is still going to be a Gaussian with the future information as a, uh, sort of determining this, this Gaussian. One of the parameters for strong antibiotics is going to be narrower than for the other. But the point is when you take a logarithm of the future information matrix, you get half log n per parameter irrespective of how long, how wide this thing is, right? So it's a very coarse measure. The thing that you are talking about, the predictive information is a very coarse measure. The thing that you are talking about would show up in order one terms, which I always throw away because calculating them would require me to do so many Feynman diagrams that I just don't want to do that, right? 
so, um, so th those would be non-universal things. The universal ones are the ones that count the number of parameters. That's number one. Number two, I think, I thought for a second, maybe you were also thinking about this, is uh, when you were asking this, uh, that, that um, again, not everything has the same value, right? Even though you're collecting this predictive bits, they could be useful, but it's unclear that all of them are equally useful, right? And I have, at the moment, no idea how to do this, but I think that both Susanna and Daniel and Talik have done quite reasonable, quite very good, actually, work on trying to figure uh, at least some aspects of these questions out, and, and Daniel is talking next. So. I just want to comment. So essentially, this is the, the value information that is coming here. There are many, uh, many bits in the future that don't care about them. Like, there are many bits that I, I can tell you that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, or not going to pay much for that. So, so here's what is going to be the value of your stocks tomorrow if they move. So, so this trade off between bits of information and value for you is precisely this great distortion like theorem. That Yes, please. So there's a, a lot of literature in both parametric and non-parametric statistics about tests and things for when the environment has changed and, uh, well, if it has changed and if so, when it has changed. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you tie into that? Um, less than I would like to, uh, but uh, when, when I was working on this uh, in 2001, 2002, sort of published a series of papers in various statistics journals. Uh, on on uh, relating this uh, sort of calculating predictive information in standard uh, non-parametric learning things. So, for example, the scenario that um, uh, I forget a uh, recent event it was you and maybe Terry Speed. I forget the papers, right? Um, I, I can look it up. It's been ten years, right? So they had a series of papers on using MDL uh, style calculations for uh, finding. Um, non-parametric probability distributions, right? And uh, those uh, those ones tied to our predictive information just one to one with no problems at all, right? So. The number of parameters k is one is not the same as the number of parameters k that you want. It seems to increase with the, the time horizon. Yes. So it seems like you could read that to guess that longer-lived animals should have more adaptation yes. norms. And then yeah. the The size of the brain should go in proportion to how long you live, more or less. So can you, uh, I'm wondering if you can predict sort of the exact scaling of brain size. I, I don't know. Time. I don't know how to do this. Uh, I think the scaling goes with the mass of the two-thirds, if I remember correctly. Um, don't quote me on this. I, we, we, should, we can look it up in, in any one of uh, uh, papers uh, on, on, on the subject, like Jeff West's. I, I, I wouldn't know. But do you even have some computing in the long-lived animals are what turtles? No, so 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 you if you plot the size of the brain um, over uh, versus the 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 duration, the time, right? Of course, you you need to start asking sort of questions like. Every individual lives slightly different amount of time. Uh, every species might live slightly different amount of time because you know they live in very different environmental conditions and things like that, right? So what the way that people typically do this, they average over, uh, let's say, all all not even turtles but maybe all amphibians <coughs> together versus all mammals versus all mammals up to a certain size or things like that, right? So when you average out specific species, there are some turtles which live very long time, but then there are some tortoises, for example, that live only a couple of years. <coughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, I would say, sorry. sorry. Susanna was, was trying to. Oh, no, no, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I would say you have to normalize via the bandwidth of the actuators. If you have fast actuators, you will have to normalize for that because... I completely agree. That's why I'm not going to go into this. In, in, uh, so the only thing we're going to try to compare are different bacteria within the same uh, um, within the same sort of global... So we're looking at Bocaldiria, right? Uh, which has about you know, 60, 70 catalog species uh, or subspecies of those with very different conditions from living in your lungs, uh, where the environment is very stationary for a very long time, uh, to living in soil, uh, where in that case they start doing crazy things like metabolizing uh, heavy metals and things like that. 
uh, this is some of the diverse classes of bacteria, uh, the most diverse groups of bacteria, and so we're trying to sort of build these correlations between uh, their expected lifetime in a certain niche versus the number of transcription factors. And again, um, let's view this as a preliminary sort of thing. I, I don't yet know what's going to come out. I think it's going to come out the right way, but I don't know what's going to come out. Uh, 